Welcome to our reading of Rashomon by Akutagawa Ryunosuke. Often hailed as the father of the Japanese short story, Ryunosuke was a prolific writer of early 20th century Japan. His works are renowned for their exploration of moral ambiguity, complex psychological elements, and a keen observation of the human nature. Today, we delve into his world through the reading of one of his most well known works, Rashomon. So, sit back, relax. And let us journey into Ryunosuke's vivid and intriguing world of storytelling. The servant's thoughts had wandered the same path over and over until they had finally arrived at this point. However, this, if only, remained indefinitely in, if only. The servant affirmed the notion of unscrupulous means, but he never had the courage to affirm positively the idea of becoming a thief, which naturally followed. The servant sneezed loudly, then rose with a great effort. The evening chill in Kyoto was such that one might want a brazier. The wind blew unreservedly through the columns of the gate, along with the evening darkness. The cricket that had perched on the vermilion column had already gone somewhere else. The servant, huddling his neck, looked around the gate, his shoulders high under the dark blue haori he wore over his sweat-stained yellow kimono. He thought to spend the night anywhere, comfortable, out of the wind and rain, and away from prying eyes. Fortunately, his eyes fell on the wide ladder, also painted vermilion, leading up to the tower above the gate. If there were people up there, they would be nothing but corpses. The servant stepped onto the bottom rung of the ladder, careful not to let the long sword hanging from his waist slip out of its sheath. Some minutes later, a man crouched like a cat on the middle rung of the wide ladder, leading up to the tower over Rashomon. He was peering up silently, holding his breath. The light of the fire from the tower faintly illuminated the man's right cheek. It was a cheek with a large pimple full of pus amidst the stubble. The servant had assumed from the beginning that only corpses were above. When he climbed a few steps up the ladder, however, he saw that someone was moving a fire around. He knew this because the murky yellow light was reflected on the ceiling. Filled with spider webs, the person on top of Rashomon, lighting a fire on this rainy night, was surely no ordinary individual. The servant, moving as stealthily as a pawn, snail, finally managed to climb to the top of the steep ladder. Then, keeping his body as flat as possible, craning his neck as far forward as he could, he peered fearfully into the tower. Inside the tower, as rumored, there were several corpses discarded haphazardly. However, the area illuminated by the fire was narrower than he had expected. And he could not tell how many there were. What he could vaguely make out was that among the corpses, some were naked and some were clothed. Of course, both female and male bodies seemed to be mixed in. The corpses all lay scattered, as if they were clay dolls that had been molded and discarded. Their mouths open, their hands reaching out. The parts of the bodies that were raised, like the shoulders and chests, received the faint firelight and cast dark shadows over the lower parts of the bodies. As they lay in perpetual silence, like mutes, the servant covered his nose instinctively at the smell of rotting corpses. However, that hand soon forgot to cover his nose. A strong emotion had almost completely robbed this man of his sense of smell. Only then did the servant's eyes notice the living person crouching among the corpses. It was a low, thin, white-haired old woman, looking like a monkey, dressed in a cypress-colored kimono. The old woman was holding a piece of pine that she had lit on fire and was peering into the face of one of the corpses. Judging by the length of the hair, it was probably a female corpse. The servant, moved by a mixture of six parts, fear and four parts curiosity, had forgotten to breathe for a moment. He felt, to borrow the words of an old chronicler, as if every hair on his body was standing on end. Then the old woman stuck the piece of pine between the floorboards and, placing both hands on the head of the corpse, she had been looking at, began to pull out its long hairs. One by one, just as a female monkey might pick fleas off her child. The hairs seemed to come out easily. As the hairs were pulled out one by one, the fear in the servant's heart gradually disappeared. At the same time, a strong hatred for the old woman began to stir within him. No, it might be a misunderstanding to say it was directed at the old woman. Rather, his antipathy toward all evil was growing stronger by the minute. If someone had asked the servant the question he had been thinking about under the gate, whether to die of hunger or become a thief, he would probably have chosen to die of hunger without any hesitation. That's how much his heart was ablaze with hatred for evil. The servant, of course, had no idea why the old woman was pulling out. 
the hair of the dead. Therefore, rationally, he did not know whether he should classify it as good or evil. But for him, the act of pulling out the hair of a corpse on the top of Rashomon on this rainy night was in itself an unforgivable evil. Of course, the servant had long forgotten that he had been intending to become a thief until a short while ago. So the servant, with a spring in his step, suddenly jumped up from the ladder. Then, with his hand on the hilt of his sword, he strode toward the old woman. The old woman was, of course, startled. The old woman jumped up as if she had been shot from a crossbow. Where do you think you're going? The servant blocked the old woman's retreat. As she stumbled over the corpses in her haste to escape and shouted at her. The old woman still tried to push past the servant. The servant pushed her back. The two of them grappled in silence among the corpses for a while. But the outcome was clear from the start. The servant finally grabbed the old woman's arm, which was like a chicken leg made up of nothing but bone and skin, and threw her down hard. What were you doing? Speak. If you don't, this is what happens. The servant suddenly unsheathed his sword and thrust its white steel color in front of the old woman's eyes. However, the old woman remained silent. She fluttered her hands and gasped for breath, her eyes wide open as if the eyeballs were about to pop out, stubbornly silent like a mute. Seeing this, the servant realized clearly for the first time that this old woman's life and death were entirely under his control. And this realization had the effect of cooling his hatred, which had been burning fiercely. What remained was just the calm sense of accomplishment and satisfaction that came from having carried out a task to completion. So the servant, looking down at the old woman, softened his voice a little and said, I am not a policeman or anything like that. I'm just a traveler who happened to pass under this gate. I don't intend to tie you up or anything. I just want you to tell me what you were doing on this gate at this time of night. That's all. Upon hearing this, the old woman widened her eyes which were already wide open, and stared intently at the servant's face. With her sharp, bird-of-prey-like eyes, reddened from the reflection of the fire, she watched him. Then she moved her lips, which were almost one with her wrinkled nose, as if she was doing something. The movement of her sharp Adam's apple in her thin neck was visible. Then, a voice like a crow's call, gasping for breath, reached the servant's ears. I was pulling out this hair. I was pulling out this hair, thinking to make a wig. The servant was disappointed that the old woman's answer was surprisingly commonplace, and at the same time as he was disappointed, his previous hatred returned, along with a cold contempt. Apparently, the old woman sensed this, still holding in one hand the long hair she had just pulled from the corpse's head. She mumbled in a voice like a toad's croak. Of course, pulling out the hair of a dead person might be a very bad thing. But everyone here, everyone who's dead here, they're all people who did things that deserved at least that much. The woman whose hair I just pulled out. She used to dry snake meat and sell it as dried fish to the warriors. If she hadn't died of the plague, she'd probably still be selling it. They say the dried fish she sold was tasty. So the warriors always bought it for their side dishes. I don't think what this woman did was wrong. If she hadn't done it, she would have starved to death. She had no choice but to do it. So I don't think what I'm doing is wrong either. This is also something I have to do or else I'll starve to death. The woman, who knew this well, probably won't blame me for what I'm doing. The old woman said something to that effect. The servant, his hand on the hilt of his sheathed sword, listened to her talk with a cold air. Of course, he was also concerned about the large pimple on his right hand, full of pus. But as he listened, a kind of courage was born in the servant's heart. It was a courage that had been lacking in him a little while ago when he was under the gate, and it was a courage that was trying to move in exactly the opposite direction to the courage he had when he climbed up the gate and captured this old woman. The servant, who had no hesitation about starving to death or becoming a thief, had almost driven the idea of starving to death out of his consciousness, so he could hardly think of it. Is that really so? When the old woman's story was over, the servant confirmed with a mocking voice. Then he took a step forward suddenly took his right hand away from the pimple, grabbed the old woman's collar, and said as if he were biting into it, then you won't begrudge me for stripping you, I also have to do it or I'll starve to death. The servant quickly stripped off the old woman's cypress-colored kimono, then he roughly kicked the old woman, who was trying to cling to his legs, onto the pile of corpses. The mouth of the ladder was only about five paces away. The servant, 
with the cypress-colored kimono tucked under his arm, descended the steep ladder into the depths of the night in no time. The old woman, who had been lying as if dead, rose from among the corpses shortly after. As she made a groaning, moaning noise, she crawled to the mouth of the ladder, guided by the light of the still-burning fire. Then she hung her short white hair, down from there and peered down under the gate. Outside, there was only the pitch black night. No one knows where the servant went. And with that, we come to the end of our reading of Rashomon by Akutagawa Ryunosuke. I hope you enjoyed exploring this tale of moral ambiguity and complex human nature. As much as I did, Ryunosuke's ability to weave intricate narratives and create compelling characters truly sets him apart as one of Japan's greatest storytellers. Thank you for joining me on this journey, and I hope to see you again in our future readings. Until then, happy reading!